Hey guys, continuing the long tradition of having fantastic guests. Today I've got uh, someone uh, who, who I can say I'm a big fan of because I've seen his public engagement. He's a fantastic scientist. Brian Hare, how are you doing, sir? Oh, I'm glad to be with you. Really uh, excited to be here. Thank you so much. Uh, so for those of you who don't know who Brian is, he's a professor of evolutionary anthropology at Duke University. And let me just read the three books. So he is a co-editor of a book titled Bonobos, Unique in Mind, Brain, and Behavior. And then his uh, last book prior to the current one that was recently released, The Genius of Dogs, How Dogs Are Smarter Than You Think with Vanessa Woods. And his most recent book, which I'm sure we'll be talking about during this chat, Survival of the Friendliest, Understanding Our Origins and Rediscovering our common hum humanity again with Vanessa Woods, who is it okay to say that she's your wife? She is. It is okay to say that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. So where do we start? So do you want us to start with the most recent book and then work our way back to different stuff? I'm looking forward to having fun. Anyway, you know, to talk to somebody who wants to talk about evolved psychology, I'm all in. So whatever, <laughs> wherever we go. Okay. Let's mind. start with survival of the friendliest. Give us the main theme of the book and then I'll interject at different points. Sure. So the idea of the book is, I mean, the title, let's start with the title. Uh, it's really uh, a play on survival of the fittest. And the idea is that in the public mind, uh, fittest has often been misconstrued to mean alpha, the biggest, the meanest, the baddest. And of course, it means how many offspring you have. Uh, so we thought it'd be fun to talk about survival of the friendliest, because if you sort of step back, look at life's big successes, organisms or classes of organisms that have really um, done well, Often it's a new form of friendliness that leads to a new type of cooperation uh, that launches them into a new level of uh, success in life. So I think friendliness is, is a winning strategy, and I think animal work shows us that we are built for friendliness, uh, and that's what the book's about. So something like uh, the theory of reciprocal altruism, which necessitates cooperation, would fit very nicely with your idea of friendliness, right? Because for us to cooperate, to some extent, we can't be bashing our each of his heads with a, with a stone, right? Yeah, and friendliness, it, it can be, I mean, it, it doesn't have to be, uh, I, you know, I'm not reinventing the wheel here. This isn't anything complicated. It's just to, to do reciprocal altruism, you have to be attracted to have an interaction. You have to want to be near somebody to actually want to trade something. Um, and so if there's a new way to be attracted instead of fearful, that's what I'm talking about. Now, I don't know if you know the word, do you know the work of Paul Zak, the neuroeconomist? Uh, uh, tell me uh, yeah he's, he's at claremont graduate university and he's, oh, cool. done, he's done work look he's a, so I, I think he considers himself a neuroeconomist so he's mm -hmm. done work looking at uh, you know oxytocin mm -hmm. uh, the idea being that for example if you and i hug one another our oxytocin will go up so so i think in support of your theory of course there are many lines of evidence that would support what you're saying but there is an endocrinological system that precisely res responds to our bonds of affiliation and so on, right? Right, and and one of the fun findings in the in the dog world uh, is that uh, dogs, as they make eye contact and as we touch them and they touch us, uh, they have an increase in oxytocin, and uh, th we do too. So there's a there's a between species oxytocin loop uh, between dogs and humans, um, and so you know it seems they've hijacked that bonding pathway. And we're we're gonna get to dog in, in a second because I'm. I, I think just as much of a big dog lover as you are. Uh, now I've heard that uh, the uh, the dilation of the pupils mm. hap is, is is this a wise tale or is it true that when dogs see you, their pupils dilate as a as a physiological signature of them liking you? Is is that true? Oh, I I don't know. I I I, I don't know. Maybe I think there's, there's a, a collaboration. Is it is it hair and sad the collaboration in science or sad and hair? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's coming. It's coming. Look so, out, folks. Yeah, because there's 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 some work actually. I'm I'm, I'm spitballing here all over the place because I'm I'm just excited to be talking to someone who, who has similar interests. Uh, there is some work that has looked at how empathy correlates with contagious yawning. The idea, uh, yes, of course, right? So so in a sense, and again, that speaks to, I mean, at least sociality, if not friendliness, right? The idea that when you yawn. I then sort of modulate in the same way that we have mirror neurons. I modulate my physiological state to yours, and I'm more likely to do so if I score highly on empathy. Have That's you looked right. at that at all? Because I know that dogs also will engage in contagious yawning. What, what are your thoughts on this whole theory? 
Well, okay, so uh, the dog story ends up being complicated. Okay. Uh, it, 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 we got really excited about contagious yawning, and we measured the heck out of it. Uh, and uh, it ends up that we really don't find a high level of contagious yawning. It's not that it's not. We literally, I literally have data on thousands of dogs. Um, and it, a small proportion of dogs do yawn contagiously, um, but it doesn't seem to be the same level of phenomenon uh, we see in primates. Um, now, there is evidence, for instance, that wolves contagiously yawn uh, to each other, um, and there may even be some evidence that dogs contagiously yawn, but the interspecific or the between species yawning, we just have not been able to demonstrate it in a robust way. But uh, I think where we have really cool data and surprising data, and sorry to move away from dogs and humans, for a moment is to talk about bonobos. So uh, um, we have some really nice evidence that bonobos do a very funny contagious yawn. Uh, they have a funny contagious yawn pattern. So um, uh, chimpanzees will yawn contagiously to those uh, group members they know. Uh, they will contagiously yawn to their family members, but they do not contagiously yawn to individuals that they do not know that are strange to them. Um, we found that bonobos actually are more likely to yawn contagiously if they see a stranger yawning. Wow. Uh, and yes, so they, they actually yawn at a much higher, I, I shouldn't say much, but a significantly higher level uh, to, to a, another bonobo they haven't met. But that speaks, I think, to another finding. I'm, I'm not sure, I saw it in one of your talks in preparation for our chat, where you said that bonobos are more likely to offer food to non-kin than kin. That, in a sense, replicates your finding that you just mentioned, but using another dependent variable. Yeah, that was it. Was actually in that line of research that okay. we discovered this about. Uh, it's exactly what you said. And the, and my joke is, if we had done the study we did with bonobos, uh, where we let them into a room full of food, um, and they had the choice between opening a door for a group member, a friend, or someone they had actually never had a physical interaction with. Um, and th it's really actually three choices because you can always just eat all the food. And my joke was always, uh, people were like, well, did you do it in chimpanzees? I said, well, if I had, the title of the paper would have been chimpanzees eat food um, <laughs> because, because they would have let in and ate the food. And so, you know, there wouldn't have been anything to measure. So bonobos absolutely uh, open the doors for others, uh, more than half of trials. But what's interesting is they have a huge preference for opening for uh, the stranger over their own group member and sharing food uh, with someone they've never met before. What's the theory regarding why? So I guess, and it relates to your to your book, Survival of the Friendliest. Why is it that, I mean, both bonobos and chimps are close cousins of ours. Yet, of course, when it comes to how brutish they are, they've evolved you know, different strategies. Bonobos being much more milder and kinder and friendlier, chimps being sort of the epitome of quite brutish. What is the most accepted theory at this point as to why they've occupied these different niches? Uh, well, I, you know, I don't know if it's accepted, but it's the one I like. Um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, together with Richard Rangham, we propose this idea that bonobos are uh, self-domesticated. They've been selected for friendliness. Um, and the reason they have this xenophilic uh, friendly response to strangers <coughs> There's been really strong selection against male aggression south of the Congo River where bonobos live. Um, and without uh, lethal aggression, because no bonobo has ever been observed to kill another bonobo, um, without the, the, that high cost of infanticide or lethal uh, between group um, uh, uh, interaction, there's just uh, upside of uh, extending your social network and being attracted to someone you haven't met because that might be somebody that you form a new relationship with that helps you uh, when there's a, a conflict within your group. I don't want to leave people thinking that bonobos don't fight because often the media represents bonobos as peace loving and hippies and those are kind of fun uh, you know, ways to talk about it. But if you're an orphan male bonobo without a mother to protect you, you don't think you live in a peace loving society uh, because you are targeted with a lot of aggression. Um, and uh, females will form coalitions against any male or actually any individual that might threaten an offspring. Um, and so they, they do use aggression, uh, they never kill. Uh, and they use aggression to make sure that no individual in the group ever uh, dominates the entire group. So they basically use force to make sure no one can monopolize power. Whereas in chimps, it's the opposite. They use power to monopolize. But so, okay, you've said that 
the selection pres- pressures, I think you said south of the Congo River. Is that what you said? Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. But, so yeah. what's but driving that selection pressure? Is, is it, is it, is it fu- food scarcity? What is channeling the selection pressures in completely different uh, trajectories? Yeah, we've, so this is something we've thought about, Richard Graham and, and Alex Rosati and I. Alex is a professor at University of Michigan, and she studies foraging psychology um, in non-humans and humans. Um, and we've thought a lot about it. And so we've come at it from two different ways, but the short uh, version of this is we think that bonobos lived in a more predictable, richer feeding uh, situation. And that allowed for female bonobos to form friendships that chimpanzee females can't afford. Um, and so because they have friendships uh, with uh, unrelated females, uh, when males get together and start being brutish and mean, uh, the females actually can overpower them and prevent male aggression. Uh, and they're very motivated to do it. They don't want their infant killed or hurt, and they don't want themselves or their, their friend to be hurt. In chimpanzee females, they just don't have those kinds of bonds. Uh, and as a result, uh, males, when they get together, can actually um, use force to do horrible things and monopolize the group. So just one last really cool fact out of Bonobo World. Uh, it's, your, it's your show. Go ahead. Well, well, I just it, it just goes with the survival of the friendliest because it's counterintuitive. But um, you know, most people think, oh, alpha males, they must have more offspring because they're working so hard to uh, be in control. Well, it ends up that the most successful, friendliest male bonobo has more offspring and more reproductive success than the most successful alpha chimpanzee that's ever been documented. Wow! So, bon- so bonobo friendliness in males and selection against aggression has paid off big in terms of uh, fitness dividends for bonobos. Now, so in the human context, you have, of course, the, the adaptiveness as an adaptation, right? Be- behavioral plasticity, right? So that my feeling, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong, uh, you often talk about all oh, the other the other species of humans. What we had over them is that we've evolved friendliness and they were more brutish. Could it be slightly more complicated than that in that we simply have greater behavioral plasticity so that, so that if the chimps are much more channelized towards being brutish, if the bonobos are much more rigid in their friendliness... We are to to I, I think you use this uh, this uh, an analogy with this you know multiple tools and the the hammer and the nail. We also oh, use yeah. it in evolutionary psychology where we say the you, the human mind is made up of a is like a Swiss Army knife, right? Each blade use serves a different function. So might it not be the case that what makes us you know uniquely un, the unique creature that we are is that we can have multiple strategies depending on which niche you put us in. Does that make us unique compared to the other primates, or do they all have that capacity? Uh, I'm not gonna. Yeah, I, I wouldn't disagree with that. The the human the human p- potential for plasticity is really um, unmatched, I would say, and I think that's what allowed us to ex- uh, explode outside of Africa um, and uh, survive and thrive. But here's here was our starting point. Our starting point was. Uh, the revolution in paleoanthropology and the realization in the last 10, 15 years that we really, as our, our species, Homo sapiens, weren't alone on this planet um, until 25, 50,000 years ago. Uh, so that means there were other large-brained, uh, culturally capable, and potentially even uh, linguistic humans that we shared the planet with. Well, those are all the normal explanations we would use to explain why we're different from other animals and we're successful. Well, guess what? They all went extinct. So if those are if, if that's what allows humans to be so successful, how come they're all dead? Uh, and so so I think there had to be some other ingredient ingredient. Uh, and I think that um, looking at other animals like dogs as exhibit A for increases in friendliness or bonobos, I think uh, that's a big part of our uh, species story. I mean, the, the the reason why I wanted to talk about you know behavioral uh, plasticity and so on is because it it speaks to a often you know, levied but deeply erroneous concern about certainly in my area of evolutionary psychology that all evolutionary psychologists care about is human universals, which of course is blatantly false because behavioral ecologists who are evolutionary minded scholars precisely spend their careers studying different adaptations depending yes. on the environment you're right. The, the use see. the use of spices 
across different cuisines varies as a function of how much pathogens there are in those environments. That's a perfect demonstration of, again, plasticity. This is a manifestation of how culture doesn't magically arise, but it's, it is usually a solution to a biological problem. What, what yes. are your thoughts on that? Yes, yeah, so absolutely. I, and, and in fact, the, the, the friendliness, uh, I think we have a unique form of friendliness um, but I think the, what that friendliness did was facilitate exactly the process you're talking about because it networked a larger group of minds together so that more innovators could learn and cooperate. Uh, I think that that's the secret sauce of our species of human versus the other species where they may have been cultural and they may have had a level of plasticity, a level of ability to reason and, and figure out the causal properties of the world to make technologies that could help them solve problems. We get supercharged, and many people have suggested this, not my, uh, this isn't you know, me alone saying this, but the idea is that when you network so many minds together, uh, you've got more innovators uh, sharing more innovations and cooperating in new and powerful ways, and that, may, that increases plasticity. Um, so absolutely, uh, but I, I agree completely, but I think the, the spark to it all is a new form of friendliness. Uh, and going back to your original point about reciprocal altruism, if you can't get together and be close to one another, you can't then cooperate. And I, I think another fun example of this is uh, cleaner wrasse. So cleaner wrasse have to swim into the mouth of predatory fish to eat. So they should be afraid, they should run away. But instead they have evolved a new attraction, an interest, a, a, a desire to have a social interaction with something that should be dangerous and horrible, but instead they have a cooperative relationship and there's nice evidence that they have mutualism and that they understand and recognize which fish are cheaters or not. None of those amazing cooperative things that are being documented could have evolved if the cleaner fish were not attracted to predatory right. fish. Right. And so, so that's a new type of friendliness that then it allows this new type of cooperation to explode. So I'm sort of arguing for the same principle in human evolution. How much of your work, so I know you, you've worked with bonobos, we're going to get to the dog cognition stuff. Uh, how much of your work has, uh, you know, gone into humans? Uh, well, it's funny. Uh, people, people don't. I, I don't think I normally am recognized as someone who studies humans. But um, all of our great ape work, for instance, we always had human children. Uh, I was always collaborating with Mike Tomasello uh, yeah. and other developmental psychologists. Um, so I have many. I have, I have many papers with humans. Uh, and my lab is currently, we're studying a lot of uh, uh, things in elementary age kids like dehumanization and uh, social dominance orientation. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I have a, I have a, a big, and, and, and in your own uh, area of research, we, we uh, have done work on uh, behavioral economics, right. evolutionary economics, and directly compared using the exact same methods, uh, non-human apes to uh, humans of different cultures and how they make discounting decisions or deal with risk. The reason I ask the question is because, you know, I'm one of the very rare and certainly, if I may say, the, the original, you know, person housed in a business school who applied evolutionary psychology to study. So cool. Like, so cool. So, thank you. Uh, and to consumer psychologists, you know, it's it's historically has been heretical to view consumers as animals, and this is this is not my term. Uh, it's, there's a thing called the human reticence effect, which I think you'd find very interesting. And the human reticence effect is this penchant or reflex to expect that every single species on Earth adheres to evolutionary principles, except uh. one called humans. <laughs> and that and now, if you if you uh, grant leeway that humans might be prone to evolutionary forces. Well, it stops at the neck. So it's fine to explain, evolu use evolution to explain the opposable thumbs, but it isn't fine to say that the, the organ that is most important in defining my personhood and yours is driven by evolution. What are you, some kind of Nazi? Are you some kind, some kind of eugenicist? Why do you engage in such post hoc, just so, storing, just so storytelling, Professor Sat? So it's very interesting. I can take the exact same, exact same structure to explain the mating behavior of salamanders or bonobos, and everybody says, my God, that's beautiful science. I take the exact same mechanisms to explain human behavior. Well, that's just bullshit, just so storytelling, Professor right. Sad. Well, I'm, I'm guessing you've seen this, and if yes, how do we get past it? How do we convince people that humans don't exist on the supra plane outside of biology? 
Yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't know that I've got the magic bullet, but I will say that my, I have absolutely encountered that. I have, I have wondered and worried as a Southerner, as someone who grew up in the South, uh, and I'm at a Southern institution on purpose by choice to be here to talk about human evolution. Um, and uh, so it's something that's near and dear to my heart to have people uh, realize the power of evolution in solving everyday problems um, and just the joy of uh, understanding, you know, where life comes from. So or how it works. But um, in writing the new book, I was shocked at uh, kind of under having a new understanding because in, in, in my, my world, I'm trying to communicate about bonobos uh, and, and great apes. And I could never really understand why. Uh, I'll give you some data. I've never, I've never told anybody this before. So I was on 60 Minutes twice. Uh, one time I was with Anderson Cooper talking about dogs, and one time I was talking about bonobos. Uh, the dog piece was about uh, a minute, and it said, go to this website. Uh, and the uh, bonobo piece was 12 minutes, and it said at the end, go to this website. So it's a perfect comparison, same host, same show, we had, in 24 hours with the dogs, uh, we had uh, almost a million people go to the website. Uh, the Bonobo website, we had 2,000 people. Wow. So, so, <coughs> so here we are talking about these charismatic beings that share our psychology in such dramatic ways that teach us so much about ourselves, um, you know, are threatened and need our help. Uh, and you're trying, often, you know, you, you get criticized for humanizing them too much or whatever. Uh, and it's this puzzle of how to talk about them in a way that would engage people to be interested. And I never could understand, uh, you know, why people have this allergic reaction to evolution, why they're not more interested in great apes, et cetera, and what can we do to, to uh, encourage it. And writing the book shocked me because I, what I didn't understand and what, what is so obvious when you see how dehumanization, the main measure that's being used for dehumanization now is the march of progress. It is the 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 peop, you know the squatted ape going right. to the full blown person whatever, um, and there is uh, a whole type of dehumanization called simianization, where people view uh, other humans as not fully human, and the animal that is used to uh, dehumanize is the great ape or is a is a is a great ape, and that. And so apes were used uh, in evolutionary by you know uh, evolutionary scientists uh, you know hundreds of years ago as part of uh, a scala natura to uh, dehumanize other uh, groups of people. And so when and then on top of that, if you if you know that people today, uh, especially people who are high in social dominance orientation, if you present them with uh, this ascent of man. And you ask them about different groups of people, feminists, uh, you know, I don't know, whatever group, uh, a race, Muslims, uh, Christians, uh, African-Americans, whatever it is, different groups. Um, and you ask them, are they fully or human or not? They're very likely to say that they're not and that they're more ape-like. Um, and so uh, I think that sort of shocked me into realizing I have this beautiful photo on the back of the book you refer to, the Bonobo book, and it's the veterinarian that uh, he's a Congolese veterinarian and he has his head up against the bonobo that I know the story and I know that they he saved her and they friends and it's this amazing heartwarming story but I know that when you show that picture to people who are high in SDO and simianize others they just say oh he's that that human being is like that ape wow and so, so I think that's our challenge. I think our challenge is because of essentialism, that people have these natural kinds and that people who are high in SEO and dehumanize, um, uh, they threaten other groups. Um, I think everybody dehumanizes, but, but in particular, if you view people with this essentialist lens and you're high in this social dominance orientation, I think that's actually what we are uh, getting resistance against. People are misunderstanding us as being part of that. Well, so I fully agree with all that you've said, but I think I've got more bad news. I think your piece of the puzzle is only one of many other reasons why it is incredibly difficult for people to accept evolution in general and evolutionary psychology in particular. So there's, I think, a set of cognitive... Lay it on me. Lay it yeah. on me. <laughs> so I'll give you a few. Uh, so I think that there's a set of cognitive and emotional obstacles that for most people are, you know, it's very difficult to overcome. So... 
for example, Richard Dawkins talks about middle world, right? It's very difficult for us. You know, our brains have evolved to understand things on a particular scale, whether it be a physical scale or a time scale, right? Uh, yeah. If you give me something at the cosmological scale, it's very difficult for me to understand. If you give me something at the nano scale, I have no idea what you're talking about. String theory, don't know what you mean, right? Yeah. Uh, right? Um, similar when it comes to distal issues. So for most people, once you, for example, start telling them, well, look, here's some very compelling ways by which we can construct a nomological network to show you that this particular evolutionary explanation is perfectly valid. And if anything, it's a lot more rigorous than most other scientific explanations. They still don't buy it because it feels wrong. You weren't there for evolution when it took place. You can't tell me what happened 3 billion years ago. Well, if, if, if I can't tell you anything about something that happened 25,000 years ago, then why are you so keen to accept when uh, astrophysicists try to explain things that happened 16 billion years ago. So, so in this case, that's one obstacle, trying to get people to accept that we can make statements that are scientifically accurate about distal events. Another set of, I think, obstacles is that evolutionary psychology in particular uh, attacks a whole bunch of different cherished ideologies that people hold, right? So mm. if I'm a postmodernist, I already mm. hate evolutionary psychology because evolutionary psychology think, argues that there are human universals. Well, mm -hmm. postmodernism says there are no objective truths, so how can you talk about human universals? That's nonsense. Radical feminists hate evolutionary psychology because they argue that there is an essentialist innate sex differences. We can't have that. Everything must be due to social construction. Social right. constructivists will hate evolutionary theory because you shouldn't assign any biological cause to any human phenomenon. Uh, and religious people will hate evolutionary psychology because we are unique and therefore we are made in the image of God. Don't give me some vulgar materialist explanation to explain why I love my children. Mm -hmm. And so it becomes really a almost impossible Herculean task to break through all those walls that people are innately prepared to erect against you. It, it, it is. I, I don't I, I, and I think those are fair caricatures uh, and um uh, you know, I, I think that you're right. It is uh, pretty frightening when you start to take it seriously. Okay, why are people not responding in uh, a way? And, and in fact, I mean, one of the things that's frightening is often people who do respond to evolutionary psychology are responding for the wrong reason. Uh, so, so I will, I will give you an example. Uh, I, I, in fact, I just did an interview before this, and I got asked the question. And we deal with it in the book is people always say, OK, well, you're saying humans were selected to be friendly. Uh, dogs uh, were selected through natural selection to be friendlier. Bonobos were selected. Let's just keep selecting people to be friendlier. Why don't we just do a big selection uh, scheme and we'll select people to be friendlier? Why not move towards that? And, you know, you're sitting there as a scientist going, what? That's what you heard as I'm talking that we should do a giant eugenics program? And 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 so. So, uh, you know, that's why we took it head on in the book. And, and I, you know, one of my colleagues here at Duke, one of my good friends, he said, you know, look, I saw you give a talk and you spent 20 minutes talking about why eugenics wouldn't work. And you only spent like 10 seconds talking about it being morally wrong. I'm like, yeah, that's because nobody ever talks about why it wouldn't work. <laughs> and, and I think the people who reject the idea that it's morally wrong need to hear that it actually wouldn't wouldn't work. So so I so I think it's even uh, <coughs> Uh, so I agree with you there and the people who reject evolutionary psychology, then there are the people who naturally are attracted to it, but I think often for the wrong reasons and misunderstand, uh, no, 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 we're not, <laughs> we're not trying to say that we're going to select humans and use eugenics. Uh, but do, do you think that we could ever get to an epistemological place where these battles will have been definitively won so that we don't have every new generation of academics trying to fight the same phoenix that rises. I, I write about this in one of my forthcoming papers, and I are because I was writing about you know the future of evolution psychology, and I was arguing that there needs to be a way for us to kind of slay those dragons permanently. But as I write this, I'm not even convinced of my own argument because I, <laughs> as I mentioned earlier, I think it is sort of a innate penchant for most people to simply be not disgusted necessarily, but somewhat suspicious of evolutionary explanations. So do you think we can defeat this or is this going to be a battle that every new generation of evolutionary minded scientists have to fight? I'm, I'm hopeful. I, I, maybe I shouldn't be. I'm, I'm young enough to be stupid enough to have some hope, I guess. The, uh, 
Um, and, and I'll tell you why, because I remember when I was in graduate school, um, you know, the section on uh, just talk, for instance, talking about eugenics, it was just eugenics is really bad. Um, you know, move on. And, you know, and now I think people in undergraduate, graduate, at least the programs that I'm familiar with are spending a little bit more time to talk about, look, here's why it was morally wrong. This is what happened. This is why uh, it was wrong. And this is why actually it would not work. Um, and so I think if that kind of program on all of those different levels um, uh, in a way that was palatable, maybe not aggressively, you know, trying to hurt people or whatever and people's ideologies, but, you know, have, uh, you know, a way to talk about it uh, that was positive or constructive, uh, that might make, maybe there, you could have some um, uh, progress. And I think even just you and others saying, here are the different um, reactions and classifying them so that people can recognize them. Exactly. Um, and I, for instance, I know uh, in my own interactions with colleagues, I, I've found that uh, I've been surprised, for instance, um, as uh, arguments have been made at universities about implicit bias training. Um, you know, I was in graduate school at the school where uh, the website was created to measure all the people on the moral uh, you know, uh, responses and implicit bias. Uh, and so, uh, I, you know, I was very well aware of the beginning of that and where that science was and following the progress. And, you know, there's now so many different reviews that say that uh, there's not, yes, it's a thing. It's, it's probably, you know, a real thing, but uh, you're not going to teach it uh, away. Um, and so, you know, all the money being spent and lip service to implicit bias training um, I think it's just uh, avoiding the real problem, and the real problem are, um, and I think we now see it, and that's it, it, the story of this book was, uh, we actually turned 90% of it in in October 2016, and the book was, hey, uh, we have uh, a nature that would allow for something far scarier than implicit uh, prejudice and implicit uh, forms of uh, discrimination. We actually have these explicit, uh, blatant sure. forms of dehumanization where we don't even see people as fully human um, and they can come back. Uh, and so we actually had to throw away half our manuscript uh, that November and uh, re rewrote half the book and it took two more years uh, <coughs> writing it um, because we wanted to be able to make the case that, um, you know, Yes, things are bad, but uh, there's there's much darker things as a result of our friendliness that are that are possible. So so I think I, I think if you know I, I think maybe we've we've all gotten a lesson in human nature here. Uh, I don't know. Maybe that'll help. Some of the best uh, you know ideologies will um, fall by the wayside here a little bit. Well, uh, ideas are prone to an evolutionary selection process, right? There's a field called evolutionary epistemology that exactly does that, right? This is this is part of something called general Darwinism, the idea being that Darwinian mechanisms don't simply apply to understanding how your eye has evolved or how the bonobo's mating behavior has evolved. There's actually many other economic systems can you can apply evolutionary principles. Uh, so I wanted to maybe uh, just mention one other thing about this tension with evolution versus other people and then move on maybe to dogs uh, shortly. Sure, sure. You are in a very interesting place, I mean, in, in terms of a, being in a, a, an anthropology department, because anthropologists are some of the folks who are, that study human behavior that are very evolutionary minded, but also, also anthropologists are some of the people that are the staunchest rejectionists of evolutionary thinking, right? So, you know, within your same hallways, you can have three people, all of whom say, yeah, no kidding, of course, humans, you know, are prone to evolutionary forces. And on the, you know, the next door, there might be someone who is an anthropologist of peace or, you know, the cultural relativist and so on, who completely disavow that idea. So how much do those folks, the cultural relativists, the anthropologists of peace and so on, still have a strong voice within anthropology? Are they starting to wane in terms of their power? Or is there sort of a, a dogged resistance against evolutionary ideas within evolutionary, within anthropology? 
Well, it's interesting you uh, say all that because I, w- I went as an undergraduate, I, w- I was at Emory, which is a four field department. So you have cultural anthropologists with biological anthropologists and medical and linguistic. Um, but then I went uh, to Harvard and Harvard has its own department of people who are just focused on human evolution. And uh, then I went to the Max Planck and the Max Planck has its own institute of people who only study evolution. Uh, and the evolution of culture. Um, and uh, now I'm at Duke. And actually, our department is, an, is a department of evolutionary anthropology. So we, we have only biological or biologically minded anthropologists. We have a department of cultural anthropology. And uh, I certainly have um, made efforts to reach out and interact. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, I think um, uh, there... In our in our uh, cultural anthropology department, one of the world's experts on Franz Boas and the history of Franz Boas is there. Um, so uh, that's led to some meaningful conversations. Um, so I, I, I think there's some bridges there. Uh, it, it it can be a a bit of a tough uh, a tough um, road, but but uh, you know I think friendliness can win the day. <laughs> It, it would be quite ironic if the guy who writes about friendliness <laughs> did not take the position of friendly. Uh, I think I'm an extremely friendly person and very warm, but yet I can also be a bit more stingy, if you want, more spicy. Sure. In some, when, when I feel as though someone is attacking truth, I can lose some of my smile and friendliness and become a lot more dogged. So maybe it's good that you have someone like you who is apparently strictly friendly uh, trying to well, yeah. I, 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 don't, I don't think my co-author would uh, would agree with that uh, the uh, l- let's just say this book was a marriage uh, yeah. she, she's, she's a science journalist so you can imagine uh, if, if you enjoyed it despite me <laughs> but 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 I would say you know being I, I w- here's what I think is the rare thing is uh, having somebody who's a southerner uh, somebody who's from the South, raised in the South, and is an evolutionary anthropologist. Um, I think if you took the field and you were look at regional, you know, origins, uh, I think that would probably be an unusual. But uh, that geographic, excuse me for interrupting you, that geographic thing still would apply today in science. I think so. Yeah. Wow. I, I, yeah, I do. I, I could be wrong. I yeah. don't know. I mean, obviously, I can think of people from the South who are who are evolutionary anthropologists. E. O. Wilson. Yeah, for for instance, uh, just as a, a random <laughs> yeah, example, yeah, like some obscure uh, guy. Yeah, yeah, who's ever heard of that guy yeah. from Alabama? Yeah. But but uh, so definitely they're Southerners. I'm not trying to say they're, they're but I think I think it's a rarity. Um, and so if I'm patient, it's because uh, almost everybody in my family, uh, you know, votes Republican. Um, you know, everybody that I know. Uh, you know, thinks that I'm still monkey boy and, you know, uh, thinks it's funny to say that, you know, uh, I think people are, you know, monkeys or whatever. So, so um, the, so I think that gives me a a level of patience and tolerance because I've, I've grown up with it and I'm used to it. Very nice. All right. Let's get to the juicy stuff that, well, I guess everything we've been talking about is juicy, but dogs. Now, let me, (laughs) let me, let me tell you about, first, you have to confirm this from a scientific perspective. Okay. Here's my theory, ready? ready. There are dogs, mm-hmm. and then there are Belgian Shepherds. Belgian Shepherds exist on a plane that is above dogs. I would argue they're above humans. And by the way, I'm not into Belgian Shepherds since it's, be- since it's become cool to be into Belgian Shepherds because of the Malinois. <laughs> I've been a Belgian Shepherd guy for 40 years. I've, I've lived with Belgian Shepherds for 20 years. So can uh-huh. you please, Dr. Hare, confirm that Belgian Shepherds are the greatest species that have ever existed on the face of the earth. I can confirm, Dr. Said, that uh, Belgian Shepherds are the best dogs in uh, your reality. Uh, oh, okay. I, 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 retract the, I retract the kiss. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I will say they're the best dogs. For you, I will say it. How about that? But, okay. Yeah. So, let, but, but seriously, I mean, uh, in, in many intelligence tests, canine intelligence tests, and I, I understand that you don't like the, the types of questions of uh, is a is a bonobo smarter than a dolphin and so on. I, and I get that and I actually lecture exactly the same point in, in my courses. But in dog cognition sort of IQ tests, mm-hmm. it seems to me that a lot of the shepherds come out on top. And this is a layman's perspective and you'll, you'll tell me if it's... I'm a, is it not simply because when you have certain breeds that are artificially selected to engage in constant interaction with humans 
then you're selecting on that intelligence. Whereas if you are a terrier or a hound that just goes out independently, it becomes harder to train you because I've selected you to not be looking at me. Is, does that make is that is that on the right track? Yes. Okay. Uh, so so uh, I would say that uh, where you got me was. Um, uh, the, the yes came with uh, if I'm a if I've been bred to chase versus interact, uh, I might uh, look for help from a human in a different way. If I've been bred to cooperate and I need you to communicate with me to know where to go next or where to look or um, how to interact with livestock. If I'm just uh, chasing quarry, uh, then I don't really need to interact with you in the same way as I might otherwise. Now, you're gonna be disappointed from here on. I'm scared you're gonna hang up on me. So, <laughs> the, the, uh, because um, uh, this radical notion of the toolbox um, and thinking about different species uh, having, uh, you know, either a hammer or a screwdriver. The analogy, I get asked all the time, tell me about the most intelligent species, and I frustrate people all the time, because I say, well, that's like, ask me, is a hammer, Better, a better tool than a screwdriver. What's the problem we need to solve? A dolphin in a tree, a chimpanzee catching a fish, like, you know. Uh, and I love to tell people, I mean, they, they talk about humans, oh, but humans are different, and you know, it's not the same, and I love to say, well, how'd you do on your um, sonar test? Uh, you know, how'd you do with your, how'd you do with echolocation. your- Echolocation. Yeah, your echolocation, not sonar, <laughs> sorry, your echolocation test. How's your echolocation, yeah. you know? And so there are ways of perceiving the world that we don't even have. Um, so how do we put that in a hierarchy? That's ridiculous. Um, and so then within species, um, dogs actually, because we have uh, citizen science data from over 20,000 dogs now, uh, I can tell you that we have really nice evidence that within dogs, um, and it's probably the strongest demonstration I'm aware of, uh, there are different types of cognition. Uh, we know that dogs have at least five different types of intelligence that vary independently. Um, we have basically how we demonstrated that is we have a set of, let's say, 10 problems, and um, we sort of had five pairings of problems. And our prediction going in was that two of these problems, um, the same psychology would be recruited to solve those two different problems that we thought were related to each other. And that psychology that solves those two problems won't help you solve the other four problems. Um, and that's how you have to be able to show that, to say they're different types of intelligence. Um, and so we have nice evidence that across individual dogs, um, there is a, a type of, let's just call it communicative intelligence, a, a empathy intelligence, a, um, a reasoning, ability to reason, uh, and memory, uh, and um, also sort of uh, an inhibitory control, self-control kind of deception uh, intelligence, let's call it. Um, they all vary independently, and uh, you're not Sorry. going to be happy when I when I tell you that on those measures, based on our citizen science data, um, uh, there's really not evidence that any breed is uh, coming out on top on all five of those. But do you get that a specific breed is statistically significantly better on intelligence one more so than intelligence? So we do. Yeah. Okay. So we do get uh, we do get uh, population level differences. Okay. Uh, it doesn't necessarily. So if we use breed groups instead of specific breeds, so, so like shepherds, yeah, shepherds. Or well, it'd be more. It'd be herding and sporting, or okay. hounds, or toy, etc. Um, we can get differences there, um, but the the effect sizes are not that impressive. Um, and this is with big data uh, relative to what we normally have. Because it seems that within any breed, um, there's tremendous individual variability. Of course. Uh, and, and so the, the within group variability is uh, greater than actually often the uh, between group variability. So um, you don't really get those nice uh, differences that you might expect. Now that's, we have found, what we have found is body size really, really matters. Um, so larger dogs have a lot more self-control um, and we also have found that uh, smaller dogs have less self-control, obviously, the inverse of that. But what's, what, they, what makes small dogs remarkable, and I think this is super funny, is we have these tests where you tell the dog not to do something. You say, don't take the food on the floor. Uh, and you turn around and, you know, uh, or you watch them. You say, don't do that, and you watch them, or you tell them, don't take it, and you turn around. And uh, smaller dogs are... Uh, 
much more deceptive, let's say. They use whether you're watching or not, and they and they they ignore you. So I mean, they're smart. It's it's like uh, you know clever disobedience. Is it like a Machiavellian um, intelligence kind of? Well, uh, yeah. I mean, they yeah. know not to do it, and okay. then you turn because when you're watching, they don't do it. But then when you turn your back, they do it instantly. Uh, so they know you're not watching, so they can get away with it. And you're now, small. So. What what ex- I mean. What might explain this is that there is a reason for me to evolve this duplicity if I'm small dog in a big world that I need to develop these strategies of deception. I mean, versus if I'm a big dog, I just show up and that's all I need to do. I mean, what explains that difference? Yeah. So I think uh, right now we I mean, I, I love the idea that different breeds have been selected for different things. And obviously, if it's if you're talking about like border collies, they're eye stock. Uh, you know, where they, they intensely stare at livestock. And I mean, that clearly very few breeds do that. And that had to be under direct selective pressure. So I'm looking for examples of breed differences. And we went in expecting to see a lot of, uh, you know, really uh, between breed differences uh, that might map on to some of these cognitive tests. But we just, uh, it's not that we don't see anything. It's just, it's not what you'd expect. And and so I think instead, like this small dog versus big dog, I think that uh, larger dogs have more self-control because they have larger brains. Um, I think it scales with brain size and it's sort of what we found between species and in inhibitory control or self-control. Um, and I think l- small dogs don't have as much inhibition and all dogs are sensitive to whether you're watching or not. So I think they're just sitting there going, well, I know he's not watching and I don't have any inhibition, so I'm doing it. Um, <laughs> And, and so, so uh, I think the larger dogs are sitting there going like, well, he told me to stay. Uh, he, he told me to stay. I shouldn't do that, uh, whether he's watching or not. So, um, so right now, when it comes to dog psychology, I'm, we don't, given the things we're interested in measuring, uh, we haven't seen the big breed differences that might be predicted. Do you get um, any differences on the, 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 you know, the finger pointing test? across breeds so for example my my naive sort of folk psychology intuition would be the shepherds are going to do better on the finger pointing thing because they've been bred to constantly look at you for for direction the terrier won't do as well is that true or no uh it is uh well this is what's interesting is that uh let me let me can i answer the question by giving you another example and we can return to the shepherd go for it Okay, so so I'm not saying that you can't select dogs for this. Uh, we know that it, that uh, the ability to read human gestures and pointing is highly heritable. We have nice evidence for that now. Uh, we know that it's a different type of cognitive ability. That it that it it really is something that you could direct selection at. Um, and we also know that working dogs, so dogs that are in the work of detection of bombs or other things. We also know that service dogs, dogs that are, that are bred specifically to work with people who have disabilities, that those populations of dogs, um, they are remarkable at using uh, human gestures. And in fact, we can use their uh, uh, testing scores on those types of tests to then predict their training outcomes before they're trained. Um, so uh, those dogs perform differently than your heterogeneous sample of pet dogs. Right. Uh, and so it, it, what, what seems to be is that when today's working dogs, populations of dogs currently being actively bred for their problem solving, not people's pet dogs that are not under direct selection for this right now. And so this is a fun story because what I'm trying to tell you is I think evolution is happening really right. fast. Is that uh, you know over four, five, six generations or 10 generations, populations of working dogs are being selected to have increased abilities whereas the heterogeneous sample of pet dogs there's a lot of relaxed selection and so there's a lot of variability there from the original population 100 years ago that might have been worked actively and that selection pressure was there but as soon as it's relaxed i think a lot of variability comes in and so breed isn't communicating what we think it does well your your point about the speed of evolution and that it's happening now brings me to uh i guess a good segue uh, the story with the silver foxes. Uh, now, this is a story that I actually discuss in one of my books, in The Consuming Instinct, when I'm talking about uh, how different toys have evolved over a hundred years to have more neotenous features. Oh, okay, yeah, sure. And, okay. and so I use then the story of the silver fox, 
which I'm, I'm going to ask you to kind of fill in, but let me just kind of give the, the people a, a background. Absolutely. So the, here what you have is an experiment, a brilliant experiment conducted in Russia where, uh, was it Russia or Ukraine? Russia, I think, right? Uh, Russia, yeah, Russia. Yep. in Siberia. Right, mm -hmm. where, you take, where you take these uh, silver foxes and you breed them for, you, you artificially select them for their docility. And then what you end up having, or would you call it, would you say friendliness? Would that be, would you say docility or friendliness? Uh, I because I have been there and uh, I've seen the selection. Uh, it is the foxes that uh, are attracted and behave in a friendly manner towards humans that they select. Okay, there you go. And now, what ends up happening by you selecting on that, let's call it a behavioral disposition, it ends up having downstream effects on their morphology, which uh, is known as pleiotropy. Right. So I select based on docility or friendliness. And then a few generations later, I've got the floppy ears. I get the neotenous eyes, which is just, I mean, when I, when I lecture about this to my students, I see their aha moment because they're completely blown away. Their brains explode. It's so fun. Right? So fill in anything else you want from that story. Go ahead. Sure. Yeah. No, I was really lucky in, in graduate school. Um, uh, actually, Richard Rangham uh, convinced me to go. Who's coming uh, next week on my show, by the way. All right, right, right. Okay, good. So you can tell him that I uh, am still, you know, like, I can't believe he did that to me. But anyway, it was a great experience. I'm just teasing. It was wonderful. But he convinced me to uh, travel to Siberia, study the foxes. Um, and boy, I'm glad I did. I was the first uh, non-Russian to ever publish a study on the foxes. What? Yeah, yeah. Wow. And, when was this? And, when did you publish this? Uh, 2005. Okay. Yeah. So everything else was in everything they published was in a journal called Genetica, and it wasn't until the mid 90s that it was uh, ever published in English. It was all in Russian. Um, so so uh, anyway, I got to go there and uh, work with the foxes. And in 1969, they began selecting the foxes. Sorry, 59. They began selecting the foxes based on their approach behavior towards humans, and then eventually their friendliness. Um, two foxes that were friendliest would be bred together. They did this again and again. They only selected the top 1% of friendliest foxes. Uh, and then after 10, 15 generations, they started to see increases in curly tails and floppy ears and uh, all sorts of other physiological changes occur as well. And the reason they know it was the selection is because the genius was they kept a control line. The control line was bred randomly for how they interacted with humans. Uh, and so that allows you to see what the selection did. And so you know that these traits are correlated. And uh, even though they didn't select for their the length of their muzzle or their size of their teeth or their ears or their tails, they have these changes that occur. Now, one of the things that gets mistold uh, in this story um, is because it's so cool. People, it's like the bonobos, people say they're peacemaking and it means they never have a fight. It's kind of the same sense. So the, not all of the experimental foxes that were selected to be friendly have all the traits. It's, it's a frequency-based change. Right. They had more of those changes. I, it would be wrong if I didn't point that out because sometimes it gets uh, exaggerated in people's minds. Um, and for me, as somebody who studies development, uh, one of the most exciting parts of this story is it seems that the mechanism for that change uh, is a developmental story where selecting for friendliness actually causes a change in how the fox is developed. And it speaks to your idea about uh, uh, neoteny and neotenous yeah. features. Um, and uh, basically, the fox work has been the model for thinking about human, uh, sorry, uh, for dog domestication, exactly. bonobo domestication. And now in the book, it really was what led us to think about human self-domestication that Richard uh, will tell you his version of uh, as well. And so it, it is it cannot be for in, in, in my perspective, a more consequential uh, experiment. And we learned so much about ourselves and other animals because of it. And it changed how I thought about evolution because I was very uh, adaptationist. You know, uh, obviously, if I'm studying it and I think it's really important, selection acted on the thing I study. Uh, because why would I study something <laughs> that natural selection didn't right. think was important? Right. Um, but I kind of got it handed to me because I went to study uh, social communication. And I thought that uh, Richard was going to be wrong, and you can congratulate him because I, I, could, I, in his office, I was like, Richard, there's no way that the foxes will be able to communicate at the level of dogs without direct selection on their cognition. You have to have selection on cognition to have an increase in cooperative communication. This is the thing that young kids do as they start to uh, acquire culture. Like that didn't happen by accident. I, you know, I with the same level of passion, I said these things, and Richard said, could be a byproduct. You should go. 
It could be a cognitive floppy ear. And I thought, oh my God, so we go. And it ends up, that's what it is. That It is a cognitive floppy ear. Uh, they communicate in the same way that dogs do with gestural communication, even though the Russians never even heard of that research and didn't even know we all thought that was so interesting. Wow. Now, in I think 1973, Conrad Lawrence and his two colleagues won the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine for their pioneering work in ethology. And of course, there's a sub-branch of ethology called human ethology. It would seem to me, intuitively, that the this work that you've described out of Russia should be a no-brainer for a Nobel Prize. Am I? Are we ready to make that prediction right here on this show? I definitely agree. See what Richard thinks. I think so, uh, and and I think um, uh, especially if people, I, if if you were to ask me, what's the thing that should catch on in evolu? If you're interested in evolutionary psychology, what should catch on? And I think one of the ways that maybe going back to the resistance to some of this thinking that could help is more experiments, more selection experiments where you select different type against different types of aggression or maybe you select for it. And we can really reveal the underlying mechanisms, both uh, genetic, developmental um, and what's plastic, what's not, uh, where you have pleiotropy. Uh, I think selection experiments have a lot uh, to speak for. And, and I think if that happened, then I think it's hard to deny uh, that your prediction is, is true. Very interesting. One or two more additional quick stories, and then I'll ask you to talk about any forthcoming projects that you're working on that you'd like to use this platform to promote. One, uh, I'm not a very uh, jealous person in the context of uh, my marriage, in part because my wife doesn't give me any reasons to be jealous, but the one time when I was most jealous actually relates to a dog so ah. so we always joke my wife and I that it wasn't you know the handsome dashing guy that he's sp- that she spoke too long at the party <laughs> that drove me crazy with jealousy it was when we got our first Belgian and I mm. was desperate to have him really imprinted on me he was gonna be my Belgian and when when she would go get up to go to the kitchen and he would follow her that's when I went into a <laughs> a crazy jealousy rage He's like, you're trying to steal my dog. I've been waiting. All-. She goes, this is what gets you jealous? Not the hot guy? It's- I said, no, the dog loving you more than me, potentially, I won't tolerate that in our marriage. <laughs> so that- so- I love it. So that's the first story. story you two, are a dog person. I am a dog person. Uh, story two, which kind of is going to build on the that I'm a dog person. There is nothing worse uh, or certainly in my life so far, may I never experience anything other as bad as this than the death of my dogs. And I always live with what I call the dark cloud, which is the as soon as they're born, they're puppies, and you know you 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 start seeing the gray coming into their muzzle, and the clock yeah. is ticking. Why isn't it that evolution has caused dogs to have a greater life expectancy than the turtles? Or, 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 you know, bird species that live for 70 years. I mean, I could have had a bird that I was born with in Lebanon before we came here. He'd still be alive today. And meanwhile, dogs come and go in a go. weekend. Is it the it cruelest is, thing in nature? It is the cruelest thing. It's terrible. And um, I, just, just to, there's nothing I can say uh, to, uh, you know, make it better. But uh, a related a related thing is, I, I, except to say that people's pain is real. Uh, you know, when people bond with their dogs, it's it's like a child or a family member. Um, and uh, you know, when a dog dies, it is just the worst thing. And you know, uh, my realization that started with obviously, like many people, watching Old Yeller, uh, and that was the first time I was like, wait, my dog's gonna die. Yeah. Uh, my childhood dog was my best friend, so I, I totally get it. I, the only thing I can tell you a sign. I can give you a science fact that sure. uh, might help is we published a recent paper, well, actually this year, we just published it. Um, we asked the question and it's with uh, Noah uh, Mackler Schneider, uh, who's at Arizona State University and Emma McLean at uh, University of Arizona. They used our uh, citizen science data with uh, you know our huge sample of 20,000 people who collected data in their homes for um, this project. Uh, we looked at different dog breeds of different sizes because, of course, larger dogs don't live as long as smaller dogs. And they asked the question, what happens to their cognition as dogs get older? Is it that older dogs, their cognition senesces at the same rate as their bodies? Or is it that uh, actually their psychology cognition is fine, their brains are fine, it's just their bodies that senesce? 
Um, and what we found, drum roll, is, and it's good news, is actually they're cognitively perfectly fine. Uh, if, if an older dog, uh, sorry, if a larger dog uh, dies at seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years of age, uh, it's cognitively the equivalent of a smaller dog at the same age. So it's not that they're losing their minds as their bodies uh, falling apart. But so, so the good news would be what? That if there's a way for us to make sure that their bodies don't age, we could have them live longer? Or what? what? What's the action well, the good, of the good I, news? I guess the good news there is there. It's it's only their bodies that are suffering, not their minds. Oh, I see. Okay, because uh, yeah, because there's there's work. I think I can't remember if it's a woman from the University of California, San Francisco, a scientist who's done work with on telomeres with worms, and the, she's shown that I, I I could be off on some of the details, but something in the order of they can increase their life expectancy threefold, uh, based on some telomere. You know manipulation. I can't. I don't remember the exact details. Can you ever foresee a possibility whereby we might be able to artificially intervene and increase dog lifespan, or are we doomed to I mean, always have I our mean, hearts we, hurt? I mean, we did. Uh, you know, we we did. Yeah. It's just it's correlated with size. Uh, right, so right, right. you know, so smaller dogs live uh, sixteen, you know, fourteen. A, a wild wolf lives six, seven years, a captive wolf, maybe 12, 13, 14 years. So, so in best case, so, you know, uh, a dog living 18, 19 years, that's an extension of life. So, uh, the question you're asking is what about Belgian shepherds? Uh, <laughs> and, and that, I don't know, yeah. uh, you know, is that something that could be selected or is there some kind of constraint there? Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. It's a great question. Yeah. All right. Uh, last question. What are some projects that you would love to promote and use this platform to do so I, I don't you know I don't really have anything to promote except for you know I hope you enjoy the book uh, and uh, I think the only thing that I'm I, I have an idea to think about with your with your audience which sure. is I think that uh, what I learned from writing this book is that cross-group friendships are our best bet to immunize against uh, the worst of human nature uh, and so any ideas for how we can build a friendlier future, I think, have to start with thinking about how we can have more cross-group friendships, whatever the groups are, whatever those socially constructed groups might be. Uh, I think we need bridges uh, via friendship. Uh, and I think if you're an evolutionary psychologist, thinking about how contact and friendship between groups um, can be enhanced. Uh, I think that's a really um, powerful use of our intellect in theory and uh, uh, research uh, effort. I will add a personal story that supports what you, the, the excellent conclusion that you just gave. So about 15 years ago, maybe t maybe 12 years ago, my dad had come over to our house. So we're we're Lebanese Jews, so we mm -hmm. come from an environment of you know mm -hmm. Jewish, Jewish, Jewish. And I wasn't like that, but certainly the family was especially coming from the Middle East where you really have to be sort of insular almost mm -hmm. to, well, to survive. Mm -hmm. And at one point he looks at me and at this point, I mean, I'm in my 40s. I'm, I'm now in my 50s. And he says, you know what I regret about you, God? I regret that I didn't send you to Jewish school or I wasn't huh? dogged in sending you to Jewish school because I didn't want to go to Jewish school. I said, you know what, Dad? The thing that you regret the most is the thing that I'm most thankful that you did, <laughs> which which didn't make, him, didn't make him happy. But it speaks to your point, which is, I then went on to explain to him, I said, by not going to Jewish school, I learned how to speak to the Greek soccer players and the Jamaicans and the Haitians and the Vietnamese. And I've had a much broader outlook and the, and the Muslims and the Christians and, and so on. And so that which you regret is what I have to thank you for. And wow. it speaks exactly to what you just said, right? That's such a cool story. Absolutely. I think the goal is how do we celebrate humanity? And I think one of the things we've evolved is uh, recognition of group identities. And um, I think that's partly what made us friendlier is that we see uh, those that are like us as our own group, but those that threaten those that we care about uh, as being part of our group, uh, if, especially if they're dehumanizing our group. Uh, you're in for the worst of human nature. And so cross-group friendships, I think, immunize us against that uh, to a degree that uh, um, suggests we should really be doggedly pursuing uh, ways to facilitate that. That's fantastic. On that note, I now have added a Southern American to my list of friends. Is that true? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Stay on the line. Thank you so much for coming on. Stay on the line for a second, Brian. Cheers, everybody. If you love the show, please spread it, support it in any way that you can. Thank you so much, Brian. Cheers.